that. So if we can call the case of uh, people be Cheryl Morgan. Case number 23S18956FH. Ah, uh, yes, the Kane defense. She'll soon learn that that will not do her any good in this courtroom. The court sentencing is to provide the notice and copy of the defense right to a public hearing. I do have a lot to say on this one, Judge. Okay. <clears throat> I'm sure you're used to it. Mr. Butler, can I give you back this? Uh, is this on? The information on Casey? No, 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 no. The, um, the exhibit. But maybe this was in the file. Okay. You didn't give that to me. You didn't give this to me today, did you? Uh, I no, just put it up there. You did. Casey. For Josh Casey. Yeah. Okay. okay. I'll give you that back and I'll give you this back. All right. Thank you. All right. Now I can get that right tile here. Let's see here. Let's see if I can get so who do we have, Ms. Custom? Cheryl Morgan, Your Honor. Morgan, all right. All right, then, Ms. Thompson, if you had an adequate opportunity to review the pre sentence report and the sentence of information with your client, I have, Your Honor. Additions, corrections, or deletions? Yes, Your Honor. All right, what do you have? <clears throat> OV3. She okay. was given five points for an injury. There was no injury. Uh, so I'm asking the court to put that at zero. If you read the police report, which I have, I don't think the police report. So let's see what the uh, description says. It was resisting. Let's start with uh, Miss uh, Bonham. Did you do this one? I did not. He's a hit. I did, but I'm reviewing the report. I can point, Your Honor. Go ahead. Okay. Your Honor, on page three of the CFJ 284, uh, go with the in the description of the offense narrative. Mm -hmm. Uh, the first full paragraph there, it says in the middle, the address is OV3, will be mentioned directly. The two officers gained control of the defendant, uh, where she ultimately was handcuffed, and she said, quote, I'm going to kill you. Cheryl then proceeded to kick the officer at the shin, OV3, OV19. Um, so that was the basis for scoring OV3, OV19. And I'm aware, Your Honor, of what the police report says. But if you read through the police report, there is no talk of an injury at all. If someone pinches you and you don't get a bruise, that's not an injury. The officer said she kicked him. If she had, then he would have put in the police report. Uh, Miss Morgan kicked me and now I have a bruise. But none of that was done, Your Honor. None. What do you mean? If PSI says that she kicked the officer in the shin. I I understand that, but they're reading it from the police report, and the police report says that she did kick him in the shin. But why is that an injury? Do you see anything anywhere that he received an injury? Well, OV five says bodily injury not requiring medical treatment occurred to a victim. OV5, uh -huh. about and three. Scoring, I'm sorry, OV3, uh, five points is what I meant. Correct. And bodily injury is not an element of the sentencing offense. And I agree with that, Judge. Okay. Review so your this. argument is there was no bodily injury, whether it required treatment or not. That's my exact argument. Okay, well, Mr. Butler, what do you think about that argument? <clears throat> um, actually, I think that um, pain or exhibiting some kind of or having some kind of pain can um, does support being injured. Um, I think that in kicking the shin, obviously, there's some kind of feeling associated with that. So, with that, there's a five points on the score. All right. It is an interesting question. Don't know that it's one that has been made before the court before. OB3 does require bodily injury, even if it doesn't require medical treatment. Now, I concur with Mr. Butler that getting kicked in the shin may be painful. 
even though it wouldn't necessarily require treatment. However, getting kicked in the shin might also not cause anybody to incur any kind of pain. And then does pain or lack of pain then relate to bodily injury? And that's an interesting question, but there's not anything in here. And I certainly don't have an impact statement unless the probation or Mr. Buckle does. No, there isn't any. From an officer that indicates here's the bruising or here's something else that would suggest a bodily injury. So Ms. Costina, I'm gonna grant your objection because I don't know that there's enough to sustain the five points. So that'll be scored at zero. What else do you have? Well, I have allocution, but that's the scoring one change issue. that I wanted made. That's the only scoring issue? Yes. All right, so that takes a total OV from 40 to 35. Yes. Uh, does Ms. Bond, does that change our level from? I a, think it does to 10. It doesn't. It does. No, no. Uh, it's still a level four. Uh, anywhere between 35 and 49 points, it's still a level four. So it remains five to 23. So it still remains five. All right, so no other objections then, uh, Ms. Constantine? Your Honor, I do have objections, but it would be a waste of your time okay, but because what you, you will argue with me. Let me ask, objections okay. to scoring, any other objections? No. Okay, and then, because we started with that, I'll go back to, you know, kind of threw me off here. Mr. Butler, did I go to you as far as anything on behalf of a victim or people? Uh, you have not yet. Okay. Um, so, you know, I think the PSI lays out um, a, a lot of information about the defendant's uh, past and, and what maybe is precipitating all of this, but nevertheless, um, we're still left at the end of the day with someone who is putting on their own safety by the capacity of the vehicle um, and anybody else on the road in danger. Um, she's a 0.18 in this instance. This is her fourth OWI. Um, not sure if the injury to the passenger was a result of the crash or something that happened prior to. It's not really you know, flushed out in the police reports. Uh, the defendant did decline ITAS. She did not want to be part of that. Um, which was not re uh, referred to that. Uh, the recommendations case is 150 days jail plus probation. Um, we have a lot of the same issues maybe that uh, presented in the last case. Your Honor sent this uh, someone out earlier today. You mean Ms. Fowler? Yes. Okay. But the difference with this is there's a guideline that is more appropriate yeah. for somebody in a similar situation. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Uh, Maybe not the same, obviously not the same degree of alcohol intoxication as a prior defendant, but certainly Once very, very more, concerned. more priors. Very concerning, more priors, yes. For 24 years ago. Right. And I know that the uh, it got changed for the 10 year rule. I know that. I read it. But that's, that's one of the reasons the 10 year rule was changed, right? Because people that <clears throat> drink alcohol in particular can have long stretches of sobriety, but then when you don't have that hint of supervision, if you will, whether it be non-reporting probation, whatever the case may be, then they go out and they drink and drive, and that's when individuals get seriously hurt or killed. Right, Ms. Constantine? Yes, Your Honor. Yeah. And as you can read in there, that she wasn't driving at first. They got lost, so then she did. and. As far as Mr. Butler's statement, mm -hmm. that well, he hasn't finished yet, so I have to go back oh, to him. But okay, um, you can finish your thought if you'd like. As far as the statement, what? As far as his statement regarding the injury, um, the person testified that he had fell during the day. Mm -hmm. So he's here. If you want to ask him, I don't need to ask him. Okay. I don't think anything was scored regarding injury to another individual no. other than the officer. And, and again, that might be a police report thing, but I don't think that's contained in the PSI. No, it wasn't in the PSI, but it was just brought out. That's why. Okay. All right, that's Mr. Why. Butler, I didn't mean to cut you off, but anything else? <clears throat> no, thank you. All right, Ms. Costing, elocution on behalf of your client. Yes, Your Honor. I know you've read the PSI, and my first argument is it's 24 years. 
My second argument is Miss Morgan has so many health problems. My biggest issue is CPAP. If you don't use the CPAP, then you stop breathing. And I really don't want to open the Ionia news and find out my client died because she didn't have her CPAP machine. The jail does not allow that. I've already called them and asked them. So I am asking this court to place her on a tether for whatever, 90 days, six months, whatever the court feels. But this is a person that she has, she's having surgery the 8th. She goes back to find out what date it is. And she can't walk. Um, she has nerve problems. She has millions of that. But my biggest issue is the CPAP. You can't, well, you can do anything, obviously. But my whole problem with this is if she dies, and she would with a CPAP, without a CPAP machine, that's why I'm asking the court to put her on tether. All right. Anything <laughs> else, Ms. Cassidy? No, Your Honor. All right. Then, Ms. Morgan, did you have anything that you want to state to the court before sentence is imposed? I'm sorry for everything, but I, I don't want jail because I had to go. I just had an EMG done, so I need to go get results, the eight, and then he'll set up surgery for my back or I won't be walking. And he just put plates in my neck and the back of my neck has to be redone. Okay. And I'll do anything I can if I don't have to go to jail. All right. Well, Ms. Morgan, if you were here earlier when I sentenced Ms. Fowler, there are plenty of similarities, but there's plenty of differences. And I'll say this, at the end of the day, when I review Ms. Fowler's sentence, <clears throat> I'll say a couple things that, that jump out at me that are very different. Right. At one point, Ms. Fowler was absolutely serious about sobriety. And I believe Ms. Fowler can do that again. She has a lot of insight when she's in the right place in her life and doing the right things with the right people. She has apparently fallen off the wagon. Your case is different. She only has two priors. You have three priors. Your bodily alcohol and content was 0.18. And here's the big difference. While I have faith in her moving forward, I do not have faith in you. You adamantly opposed ITAS. You then, as I read through the PSI, and then with your attorney's comments here today, you use your physical condition, and I'm not unsympathetic to your physical conditions, saying that, well, I'm not going to be able to do community service because I just have these physical limitations. Well, I can't really do jail because I have these physical limitations. Then you go on to say that transportation is going to be a problem for you because your significant other works long hours. <clears throat> Everything in this PSI that was floated by you is, in fact, a barrier or an excuse as to why you can't do anything that would ensure that the public is protected from you, the drunk driver. That's much, much different than the other individual that I just sensed. The other thing that I note when we go to this is this is a four. And I will say, when I read the PSI, and we've touched on this as far as the guideline scoring, Ms. Morgan, this is pretty common. You may not know that because you don't have to sit through these dockets every day. But often people will come to court and they'll espouse one thing <clears throat> that's very different than how they live their life. Your case, it's like, I've got all these physical maladies. I can't do X, Y, and Z because, oh boy, my, my physical condition. But what did we just read in the PSI? Well, your physical condition did not prevent you from driving under the influence that day. In other words, it didn't prevent you from obtaining and 
ingesting enough alcohol to be a 0.18, your physical conditions did not prevent you from fighting with the officers, pulling your arms away, making a fist, telling them that I'm going to kill you. Your physical condition, whether it caused injury or not, didn't prevent you from kicking an officer in the shin, right? So it's kind of is hard to buy when I hear today, judge, boy, this problem I have and this problem, I just can't do any of that because of my physical condition, but I can kick a police officer. They don't go together, do they? And I have a tendency to believe when one is able to be out there not facing the music, so to speak, not here to be set things, that the closer version of the truth is the person that can tense up, ball up their fist, pull their arms away from the police and kick them in the shins. That would suggest much more physical, being much more physically robust than what is being presented to the court this morning. And then regardless, whether that's accurate or not, the facts of the matter are this is a fourth and you were a 0.18 and then maybe the most important difference between now and the other individual I sentenced earlier, Ms. Fowler, your guidelines are five to 23. So they are guidelines that are much more specific. And I can't believe that nobody mentioned this to the court today, but the court has made a note of it. I've said over and over and over, I'd like to start at the middle and then go up or down based on what's appropriate in the PSI. 14 months is the middle of the guidelines. This is now a fifth time individual that has been drinking and driving. And there's no doubt that Ms. Constantine's correct. When we go long periods of time, four, four times, today, this is the fourth time. That's when right. we go long periods of time, that's the very thing that society can't solve. Individuals with a drinking problem often are the most successful on supervision. For whatever reason, several people, many people with drinking problems can kind of almost go cold turkey. They're model probationers. And then the minute they graduate, they're down in the local bar drinking. It's kind of an interesting phenomenon. Nobody seems to look at it. But the problem with that is we have these long stretches of no criminal activity. I would tell you that statistics would bear out the idea just because you went that long between convictions doesn't mean that you were not drinking and driving. That just means how long it was before you got caught. Because it would be an incredible coincidence, wouldn't it, Miss Morgan, that the one time that you drink and drive with a gap of 10 years is the one time you get caught? Everybody knows that's nonsense. But the fact of the matter is, here we are, fourth offense today, three priors, a 0.18, and a guideline range that is five to 23. I'm not interested this morning with you, Ms. Morgan, as particularly with everything that you've had in this PSI that you don't have any interest in ITAS. You're not interested in addressing your alcohol problem. You don't think that you have an alcohol problem. You tell me you can't do community service. You're not interested in that. You're not interested in complying with any sort of supervision because you have these transportation issues. It's excuse, it's excuse, it's excuse. Not once have you referenced to probation that I'll do this or I'm going to do that. It's all what I can't do. And then you have a pretty bold argument today that, well, I shouldn't do any jail. How is that going to protect the community from your drinking and driving? How is that going to serve as a deterrent to others? How would this court look when a fourth offense drunk driver gets no jail time? How does this court look if I even entertain that and then you're out six months from now, a year from now, two years from now, and you seriously injure or kill somebody? They don't care about your argument or Ms. Constine's or the prosecutors. The only person then that looks like an idiot is the court because they're going to go back and say, well, what was your sentence? And they guess that idiot judge four times now she's been convicted. And he allows her back into the community where she can then endanger or kill somebody again. We can roll your eyes, but it happens every day. Miss Morgan, I don't need to hear anything from you. 
You've already had your opportunity to speak. So you can roll your eyes, but that's exactly what happens. And guess what? Ms. Constantine, Mr. Butler, and I would not be employed if we didn't have folks like you that refend, reoffend, reoffend. And I kind of wish that I didn't have that job because once somebody, if there was a magic cure, you got an alcohol problem, you got a drug problem, we could fix it, that'd be fantastic. I would gladly go find something else to do for a living. Because honestly, this gets kind of old. The carnage, the damage, the death is a result of people that drink and drive, that use drugs, that commit crimes while using drugs, commit crimes to obtain drugs. And you're no different. And we've got a guideline range in a criminal history and a fact pattern here that all suggests that the sentence that I'm going to impose is appropriate. So Ms. Morgan, I am required to impose a $130 crime victims assessment. That's required by statute, the court will do that. I am required to impose, not required, but I am going to impose court costs of $550. I'm required to impose state costs in the amount of $136. And that is broken down $68. I was found on accounts one and two. And then Miss Constantine, I'm going to eliminate 32. You retain, is that right? Yes. All right. So the court will eliminate 32. <laughs> I'm also going to impose a thousand dollar fine. And then as it relates to count one, now this is the operating while intoxicated. Miss Morgan, the court's going to impose a sentence of 13 months with the Michigan Department of Corrections to the statutory max of five years. You will receive credit for two days you previously served. On count two, the court's going to impose a sentence of six months to statutory max of two years. You will receive credit for two days that you've previously served. One and two will run concurrent, one with the other. Now, Ms. Morgan, you do have a right to seek appellate review of the sentence the court's just imposed. If you'd like to do that, you have 21 days from today's date to make that request. If you want a court appointed attorney to assist you, you have a broader window of 42 days. So 21, 42. Ms. Constantine, do you have the appellate paperwork there? So for the record, I'm placing the executed uh, paperwork in the file. Anything else from either side? No. All right. Ms. Morgan, you can have a seat with Ms. Fowler. We'll have a deputy here to retrieve you. Thank you. Your Honor, could you please discuss what we're supposed to do with the CPAP? Just let her die. I have no idea what to do with the CPAP. It's not the bailiwick of the court to instruct the jail or the Department of Corrections on how to manage the health conditions of their inmates. I have no jurisdiction to do that. I would never even entertain the idea that somehow I'm a medical expert to tell them how to handle the medical issues of their inmates. That's something that you're going to have to take up with. I assume the Department of Corrections if they can get her on the road today. Yeah, I don't know. All right, Ms. Morgan, have a seat, please. What else do we have? We're going to get a jail called the case of Timothy Arlo Sutherland. The case number two three S one eight seven nine six F C. It's present via Zoom. So, Mr. Lincoln, last but not least, huh? I thought they brought him over for sentencing, right? Uh, would you like him yeah. here? Carlo, do you want to come over for sentencing or do you want to stay there? This is fine. Okay. All right, so Mr. Sullivan, just because you're you're comfortable then appearing remotely for sentencing? Yes, sir. Okay, then uh, Mr. Lincoln, do you have any uh, additions, corrections, or deletions to the PSI? <laughs> Right. No, Your Honor, we believe it's correct. All right. Then, with accurate information, Mr. Butler, do you have anything on behalf of the people? I'll just briefly, Your Honor. Um, it did look like uh, both IPS and adult recovery court were looked into, but the defendant was ineligible due to his residency, from what I understand. Um, in this case, though, the defendant has received a lot of um, services as indicated in the PSI, Tri Cap House of Commons, treatment. Wedgwood, all for a past meth um, situation. And then 18 months following discharge um, and services, he picks up another possession of meth. Um, 
know, if this is a situation where the recommendation is 10 months, the transformation the agreement is just a total move within the guidelines. Uh, I'm not sure what else this board can offer um, locally to a defendant like this based on what <laughs> yes, you do. Are. What's that? Yes, you do. We've been talking about specialty courts all morning. Swift and sure. Wow. That's why the recommendation was made. Swift and sure, we got one more specialty court to track. I, I didn't see those recommendations. <laughs> it's not what it was for discussion. Not something uh, at least I'm particularly uh, enthusiastic about. So I wouldn't. <laughs> you you got to get on the specialty court train. <laughs> yeah. So I, I would recommend a, a deal. All right, Mr. Lincoln, any allocution on behalf of your client? And if it saves some time, I'm going to let him have a crack at Swift and sure. Did you uh, read my sentencing brief? I did. Well, I said in there that uh, 30 years ago, because I knew Arma 30 years ago, that I thought he was a waste of human flesh. And at that point in time, I did. And for year after year after year, Arlo was intoxicated seven days a week. He was doing absolutely nothing. But he did solve that problem. He doesn't drink anymore. And when he got caught with methamphetamine, he kind of fell on the sword for a girl, which we talked about. And he, he's not going to be able to be around her. Um, and I appreciate the court saying you're going to put him in specialty court. Uh, several years ago, this court put one of my clients in specialty court. And about two years after specialty court, the Swift and Sure, I met him and asked him how it was going and his response, I can't wait to get off probation. I want, I want to go back to it. Arlo won't do that. He's decided that uh, he's in his fifties and well, that's he another doesn't reason. have that much time left and he has yeah. made changes in his life. And I think, I think he would be a, a star in especially of course. All right, Mr. Sutherland, anything you want to say before the court poses signs? Uh, I did quit drinking a couple years ago, and it wasn't because anybody told me I had to. I just did it because uh, I was having issues with my feet, my bones. I thought it was because of the alcohol, so I quit drinking. Um, the I think the prosecutor said something about the meth when I went to the other places. Not meth; it was I was smoking marijuana. Probably in other places back in the day, but um, I, I don't know if you let me do the uh, switch and sure, I'll I'll be able to complete it. I'm, I'm not doing any drinking, I'm not doing any drugs. And the, the reason I'm here right now is because I found violation for the pot, but I, was, I had an operation. So I, I've been taking marijuana for the bone problems, but um, I, I quit that too, but I, I had that operation. So I smoked some pot and that's what why I'm sitting here. Well, that's not why I'm sitting here, but the bond thing was for that. And it, but I'm not doing any drugs, I'm quit drinking. I'm ready to get on my life and I will, you know, I'm ready to take. Okay. Well, Mr. Sutherland, I won't belabor the point then. I, you haven't been here all morning, but you certainly are somebody that fits the criteria for Swift and Sure. You got a history of criminal convictions, you got a history of unsuccessful supervision. Um, Everything fits for swift and sure. Now, you've certainly uh, had the opportunity to try supervision. You've had the opportunity to try jail. You've had the opportunity to try prison. And for whatever reason, it just hasn't worked. I can tell you that swift and sure um, is a different sort of supervision, if you will. And we'll talk about that more once you are uh, uh, in, you know, done with your jail. We'll have you back. But... Bottom line is they're going to hold you accountable for everything that you do that's outside the parameters of the program, and it's going to result in immediate incarceration for a defined time, usually a weekend, 10, 15 days, something like that. And the one thing that we have found, again, and I, I do have my doubts about people getting clean and staying clean, especially when the supervision ends, is Swift and Sure, for whatever reason, seems to work when people know up front. What's going to happen? It's going to be immediate jail. It's going to be a few period of time and I can get out. And that combined with your age, Mr. Lincoln's right. The thing that we have seen with folks is about when they start reaching your age, early 50s, mid, late 50s, people just get tired of 
doing a life sentence, 15, 30 days at a time, a year at a time, a short prison stint at a time and back and forth. They just get tired of that lifestyle. And so we'll see how that works with you. I, I, I wish you all the best. I'm certain that when I see you again for the orientation, we'll talk about this more, but the bottom line is you're gonna hold the keys to the car, so to speak, all right? If you can comply and follow the, the rules, then you'll be fine, you know, and that'll give you five years or so of sobriety, which hopefully puts you on the right foot. If you complete that, that you, you know, by that time you'll be about 57, then maybe you can finish off the rest of your life clean and sober and, and living the life the way you want rather than always looking for red lights behind you, red and blue lights behind you, or reporting to a supervisor, whatever the case may be. But you'll hold that key, so to speak. So I'm going to place you on a period of supervision for three years. I'm not going to go over all the terms of your supervision because the only one that matters right now that your agent will talk about you later is that you'll have to participate in and successfully complete Swift Insure. Obviously, there'll be no drugs or alcohol while you're being supervised and you'll be tested for the same. Then I'm also going to order a curfew, 10 p.m. to 6 a.m., and then employment of 30 hours a week or a combination of employment and your supervision obligations. And then as it relates to the incarceration from now, the court's going to impose 10 months on count one and 10 months on count two with credit for 117 days you previously served and those are run concurrent one with the other. And like I said, once you get close to that release date, then the court will see you to orientate you to the program. I am required, Mr. Sutherland, to impose state costs, and those will be broken down as $68 on count one, $68 on count two. I'm also required to impose $130 crime victims assessment in the amount of $130. While you're being supervised, your supervision fees will be $30 for a month. And then I'm going to impose court costs in the amount of $550, and then I'm going to eliminate item 25. I believe Mr. Lincoln is retained. Mr. Sullivan, you do have a right to seek appellate review of the sentence. If you'd like to do that, you have 21 days from today to date to make that request. If you are a court appointed attorney, you have a broader window of 42. So 21 and 42. Mr. Lincoln will just help us get that back in the file. Oh, I'll have to get this submitted. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yes, and so if I didn't do that, yeah, that's important. Uh, 90 days of tether. Did I not see that in here? Did no, I because know? I didn't. No, I didn't. Really oh, yeah, know. okay. So that'd be a, a 32 uh, tether for 90 days upon release. Okay. John, All right. Yeah. Um, am I able to go back to my own house? In Switch insured, do I have to, I have to go to the Lake address? You got to be in the county. So I will have to go stay at my dad's. Okay. Fair Anything enough. else? And then you said like 30 hours. Can I, I but I work, uh, I'm truly going to get my job back and I work 12 hours a day sometimes during the summertime. I work all summer, I work 12 hours a day. Is that going to be an that's issue? That's fine. Nobody's okay. going to try to limit you from working. But, all right, you just have to make sure that your agent knows ahead of time because of that curfew, okay? Yes, sir. And I, I think I worked in section second shift also, though. So, I mean, I've, I'll work that out with it. If you want to work 16 hours a week, I'm not going to have anybody stand in your way. But if you're not at work, then you need to be home. 12 hours a day, not, not a week, 12 hours a day. But look, I, yeah. I understand, sir. Yes, I understand. Um, I, I, I don't mind if you want to work 18 hours a day. I don't care. Okay. Right. You, we're going to let you work, but you still got to fulfill the probation obligations. One of which is you have to be in your home if you're not at work. All right. And until That's we right. get that cleared up, it'll be 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. Okay. You got to, do I need to make a motion to change that? Because no, we'll go back to work. It's probation aid. Nobody is going to okay. say that you can't work. All right. And now if he does run into that kind of problem, file a motion. But I, don't I was that. wondering if the agent had the right to change those hours. Because yeah, 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 yeah. I can all be, kinds of flexibility. start hauling in the crops is what he will be working. Yeah, I give him all day. kinds of flexibility. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Good luck, sir. Thank you, Your Honor.